So, uh, Shinobi Bansal, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you and thank you very much for joining uh, today's session. My name is James Hughes. I'm the Minister Councillor for Economic Affairs at the British Embassy in Warsaw and it's my great pleasure to be able to kick today's event off uh, this morning. Um, our, uh, this is about a year since we held our last Industry Day uh, here in Poland. Uh, uh, so, uh, as we're saying, uh, we last had our so many years ago with the British government and the officials sharing information uh, in the run up to the end of the transition period following the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. And so, today's event has been organised in a similar vein as part of our ongoing efforts to support. And our support to businesses here in Poland. Uh, and this is the latest in a, a long line of engagements that we've been conducting over the last year. Um, and so we at the embassy are delighted that you're able to join us this morning um, and that uh, both British and Polish experts together. The outset, what I would like you to do is invite everybody to take part today to share your experiences and concerns and to ask questions of the presenters, of the experts joining us today at the event during the course of the event. This is an event that is as much for your benefit as it is for ours. Please do make the most of the opportunity at the end today. Now, the UK has huge importance uh, on our trading relationship with Poland. Uh, our bilateral trade is worth approximately £20 billion a year, having almost doubled in the last decade. And as you all know, on Christmas Eve last year, the terms of our trade changed uh, following the United Kingdom's agreement on the historic trade and cooperation agreement with the European Union. And I hope most of you are now familiar with the terms of that trade agreement, uh, which support the flow of and reduce administrative costs to traders. Uh, and these provisions include zero tariffs and zero quotas on trading deals between the United Kingdom and the Union. Streamlined custom and recognition of our respective trusted trade schemes. The deal also provides for ongoing cooperation with public, animal, and plant health and limits tech barriers to trade. And since January this year, uh, Poland and other EU member states have been applying the EU customs code on trade with the United Kingdom following the end of the transition period. And we in the UK have to put some of our own controls in place. The groundwork that we laid in preparation for the end of the transition period and our ongoing work uh, in support of business readiness has meant that we have not seen anything like the disruption uh, that many have predicted before the end of the transition period. And supply chains have shown themselves to be largely resilient. While UK Poland trade did fall at the start of this year, a more optimistic pattern has since emerged with Polish exports to the United Kingdom having almost returned to normal levels and UK exports also heading now in this direction. It's fair to say though that the last 18 months have been challenging for businesses uh, and the impact of the COVID pandemic has been severe uh, in the United Kingdom, in Poland and in the globe. So many businesses have not had the time to prepare uh, for the changes on so therefore, the United Kingdom government decided to introduce further import controls in a phased approach in recognition of the focus and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. While we had initially extended the date for making import controls at uh, October 2021 and January 2022, we recently pushed these dates back again, uh, meaning import declarations will apply in January 2022 the full import controls will now apply from July 2022. So today's event involves an excellent range of UK and Polish experts to take part to explain when and how these further controls will now be introduced. Uh, we will also today cover the conformity marking requirements, which are due in January 2020. So today's event is part of a concerted effort, as I've said, to help business continue to prepare and adapt 
to our new terms of trade. Businesses do need to take the time to prepare for the additional changes to UK import controls. Uh, and we continue to pull out all the stops to support you doing this, including today's session, running a, a major public information campaign to keep business moving, uh, providing a dedicated email inquiry service for Polish businesses, and publishing comprehensive plans, including in Polish language, uh, on gov.uk, and supporting similar advice uh, on the Polish government's equivalent call form. So supporting and growing key Poland bilateral trade and investments is an important element of our mutual economic recoveries to build back better in the pandemic. And there will inevitably be further challenges to come, but we feel that there will also be major opportunities. And we in the United Kingdom are determined to help Polish businesses take advantage of those opportunities and to support a new. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and now we're going to pass to uh, the, the, the meat of the programme, but thank you for joining us uh, this morning and do make the most opportunities to ask questions and to share your feedback. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, James. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Margaret Whitby and I work for the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. We are part of the Cabinet Office uh, in uh, the UK government. And um, we've brought together today a, a group of colleagues from across government. And of course, more importantly, we've got um, uh, representatives from the Ministry of Finance in Poland. So as James says, we've got a full agenda for you today. Um, on the next slide, please, we've got um, just a couple of ground rules. Uh, please do ask us questions, as James said, throughout the webinar. There's a Q&A function and I see many of you have found it. Um, and uh, please do ask us those questions um, and we'll pick them up at a session in the end or perhaps much of the material may answer your questions, but uh, send them through. Um, we will publish a recording of this webinar. Um, we will share the slides used with you today in English and our colleagues at the British Embassy in Warsaw are going to translate them into Polish and we'll send them to all attendees in Polish. Um, we have asked all of our speakers today to speak slowly and clearly we recognise that we are delivering this in English, um, but please do let us know if you need us to slow down. There is a lot of detail included, but we will share the slides so you can go through it in slower time as you need to. Um, and um, we will also capture all of your questions and uh, answers to those and share those with attendees as well. On the next slide, we have um, a brief outline of the agenda. As I said, we're very pleased today to be joined by uh, Eva Bukowski from the um, Customs Department um, in Poland. Um, we've got customs procedures in GB, um, Rep HMRC are covering that. Um, the SPS procedures, the sanitary and phytosanitary procedures in GB will be covered by um, Andrew from the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, we've got uh, Lucy Dennis um, from our team in BPDG to tell us a little bit about Kent and the Short Straits. Erin um, Fair is going to talk us through the UKCA marketing requirements. Um, we'll tell you about work in the future on the sing single trader window. And um, then we're going to tie it all up with some case studies and then the Q&A. So that's a brief run through the agenda today. On the next slide, please. We have a question for you, please, before we start our presentations. Um, the first question is about, we have three questions throughout the, um, the event, so not too many to deal with. But the first question is about whether you've moved goods between the EU and GB since the 1st of January. So um, you could use the QR code there or to log into www.slido using the hashtag BPDG and answer this first question of three for us. Thank you very much. We'd be grateful if you could participate in our poll. While you're all thinking about that, if we could move on to the next slide. As you'll be aware, we've got uh, import requirements coming in um, in GB. We have phased in the introduction of some import requirements. So there are some key dates summarised here. Our presenters will talk through them in more detail later on, but this is a useful slide, I think, just to remind you about those import requirements. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it is there in the pack for you um, to look at and summarise. Um, so I think um, the next slide, please, then. 
is our second question. And this is about um, your awareness of the procedures in GB. We appreciate you've joined the webinar today to learn more about it, but do you know what procedures are required or do you not know what procedures are required yet? We'd like to get an understanding of readiness across the EU so that we can uh, keep importing goods from the EU. So if you could take the time, please, to log on to our Slido poll, a question to Thank you. And the next slide, I think, is our introduction. So, Ava, if I can hand over to you, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I am Eva Bukowska from the uh, Customs Department in the Ministry of Finance in Poland, and I will be speak about the export procedure for union goods leaving the EU customs territory. And I will be focused on things in relation to uh, moving goods from from Poland to the uh, Great Britain. And uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, at the very beginning, I would like to 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 remain the main rules, uh, as we all know for sure that as of first January that year. Uh, for goods taken out of the EU customs territory uh, to the United Kingdom, uh, the um, export declaration uh, must be uh, must be lodged. Uh, we have one exception in concerns Northern uh, Northern Ireland, which is treated as Union customs territory. Uh, so no uh, export declaration is uh, is needed. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, at that slide, I point out places where uh, more information regarding export and transit procedures uh, may be found. It's uh, our Polish websites and uh, unions uh, website uh, as well. OK, next slide, please. Thank you. Before we start to speak about export, I'd I would like to refresh what the entity have to do in order to start customs formality. So uh, the first steps, uh, the entity uh, shall register in a client and receiving ORI number. Uh, the applications uh, for a client and for uh, ORI number uh, shall be lodged electronically. And here you have the uh, website where you can uh, can do it. Uh, after registration, after registration, and um, after you receive ORI number, uh, you shall to decide to decide whether uh, you will be act by himself or use the service of customs agency, logistic agency, and be aware that if you mm, decide to act by uh, yourself, uh, the IT application allowing to submit export or transit or uh, import um, customs declaration uh, is needed. So uh, you have to, to to have some that uh, IT uh, IT tool. So next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so let's start about uh, exporting. Uh, export declaration is needed for union goods taken out of the EU customs territory, and also for union goods moved to special fiscal territories. And export declaration is uh, is needed also uh, for goods declared for outward processing and uh, end, end use. Uh, next slide, please. So now few uh, few words about outward processing and end use. Uh, so there are the special procedure. And outward processing um, allows union goods 
to be temporarily exported from the customs territory of the Union in order to undergo processing operations outside the customs territory of the Union. Uh, the processing operations may be, for example, working of goods, including correcting or assembling them or fitting them to other goods, processing of goods, repair of goods, including restoring them and putting, putting them in, in order. And afterwards, the process products resulting from those goods may be released for free circulation onto the EU customs territory with total or partial relief from uh, import duty. Uh, next slide, please. End use procedure allows for certain goods uh, when they are released for free circulation to be subject to a reduced rate of duty or or a duty exemption due to their specific use, and they remain under customs control until they are put to their prescribed end use defined in the applied common customs tariff. Yes, the, uh, next slide, please. So for this uh, special procedures, authorizations are needed. Uh, for such authorization, uh, you you can apply uh, can apply person uh, who are established in the customs territory of the union and persons who provide the necessary assurance of the proper conduct of the uh, of the operations. Next slide, please. Authorization uh, may cover only one member state, Pol Poland, or more than one member state, meaning Poland and other member states. And how to do it and uh, the form of application uh, you may find on the website. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, Authorization covers more than one member state uh, shall be lodged uh, via the EU Central Customs Decision System and the um, operators have to connect to the EU Trader Portal, a single uh, electronic access point delay deployed at EU level for accessing the customs decision system. The information about the authorization number should be reflected in the in the customs declaration. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, export declaration and all export formalities are conducted in IT system uh, called as uh, ECS2 uh, in electronic way. A paper form is allowed only when IT tool temporarily doesn't work and for travelers. So uh, now I would like to tell a few, uh, few information concerning the presentation of goods. So, uh, first of all, I would like to stress out that the goods must appear at the office, at the office of ex export and at the office of, uh, of exit. And information about presentation shall be provided electronically. Uh, since 1st October that year, is the electronic form is uh, obligatory uh, for export and for transit started in Poland. Uh, so uh, there are the electronic messages EF 507 for export uh, and EF 007 for uh, phone transit. Uh, please send these messages uh, after the goods are in the office, not before, not after the goods are uh, released for uh, for procedure. 
um, we have large list of person who can uh, do it and it can do uh, almost everyone. It can be customs agent, driver, forwarded. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, we don't ask for a formal representation registered in the a client. So we don't validate whether somebody who sent the someone who sent the um, electronic message is authorized uh, to to do it in the um, to do it. Yeah. And next uh, next slide, please. Mm. So emails to the um, customs office or MRN presented in uh, other way are still accepted, uh, but only in exceptional circumstances. Uh, for example, when the IT tool doesn't work, uh, for operations started in other member states. So where the customs office of export is, for example, in Spain. Uh, and we accept it also in our uh, east border. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, now, a few words about the Office of Export. So, the main rules is that the um, Office of Export is the office where the exporter is established or the goods are packed or uh, loaded for export shipment. Um, but in Poland, we create our national solution uh, allowing to be customs office of export also another office in Poland, but under some uh, conditions. Uh, first condition is that the exceptional circumstances uh, shall appear. It means that uh, we have perishable goods or the situation where uh, delivery just on the time. Uh, after pure acceptance uh, of the intended customs office of export, done in regards with each shipment, not a general approval is needed. And uh, in the export declaration, the additional uh, information code GPL27 uh, shall be indicated. OK, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to stress to point out again, especially for the entities from other uh, member states and the British uh, British uh, entities also, that the goods shall be presented at the office of export and uh, office of exit, it's meaning that it must appear at the um, place place of the office or at the place indicate um, place indicating the uh, customs authoriz authorizations goods must be presented together with the MRN number due to certain formalities are to be completed at the customs office uh, such as the verification of the declaration and if necessary the examination of the uh, supporting documents and uh, or, or, or goods uh, controls on whether the goods are subject to pro prohibitions or restrictions and in the office of exit goods are uh, subject to customs controls uh, related to the completion of exit formalities and the confirmation of the exit of the of, of the goods so we recommended uh, to print export anticipating document and present it to the office of exit. Please ask your drivers to present EAD at the border. It allows to smooth passing via EU border. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now a few words about the customs office of exit. So it can be the office at the EU, uh, EU border, for example, French office. 
uh, office in inland office, for example, uh, office where the transit starts. And office where goods are taken over a single transport contract. Uh, next slide, please. Few words about a uh, single transport contract. Uh, so exit formalities are performed by the office competent for the place where goods are taken over a single transport contract. Applies only where the goods are to leave the customs territory by rail, post, air and sea or sea. A single transport, transport contract may take the form of an airway bill, a maritime bill of loading, a SIM or SMGS consignment that covers the transport of the goods to a destination outside the customs territory of uh, EU. And next slide, please. One important remark. Speaking post, we mean only Poczty Polska. It's the Polish post operator acting under uh, UPU convention. Uh, road transport is not a single transport contract. When the goods moved via road, uh, two ways are possible. First is the is open transit inside EU territory or presented goods at the office of exit at the border. I conduct the customs formalities. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, now I would like to, to present a few, uh, few good practices when uh, while exiting goods via um, France, uh, France border. Uh, first, please declare the proper office who can perform uh, exit formalities. The proper offices are uh, Calais to Airport and Dunkirk Ferry Office. Uh, please be aware that the Calais, Calais office, Dunkirk Port Office and the Dunkirk Energy Office are inland offices uh, who can perform exit formalities. Uh, second advice is Please use French uh, logistic document envelope and uh, present uh, also EAD export accompanying document with MRN number uh, at the border. The logistic document uh, envelope help to organize work on the uh, on the border and uh, the. EAD is the customs document, very useful when uh, customs formalities uh, at the office of exit are uh, performed. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, now, step by step, how to manage at the French office of exit. First of all, please take logistic envelope, then you enter the area of customs office. You will have migrant control. Uh, then please present the goods for customs formalities. Uh, present the envelope and the EAD export accompanying document to the pairing agent who scanned MRN number. After that, you will have potential customs. You will have um, customs control. And at the very end, exit confirmation after embarking uh, will be done by the office of, uh, of exit. Next slide, please. And one more prompt. Um, after exit conf confirmation by the office of exit is done, the envelope, the logistic document is not presented at the dedicated IT tool. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now short information about the exit summary declaration. 
So exit summary declaration is the safety and security data. And I would like to, to point out that in Poland, uh, we we allow lodging uh, safety and security data uh, together with customs declaration. Uh, separately, only when the custom declaration is not needed. And then we we process um, exit summary declaration electronically in a ICS2 uh, system. Uh, it's the message EA615. And the exit summary declaration can be lodged by the carrier or drivers to the to the office of uh, of exit. That's that's all for for my side. Thank you very much for your for your time. And of course, I'm waiting for your for your questions. Eva, thank you very much. Um, and just to uh, re-explain for the audience, um, Eva has presented in English today, but we will be translating the slides as well into Polish and sharing those with you too. Um, it's quiet at questions at the moment, Eva. We have a question about EAD numbers that we can consider um, and whether the, sorry, the EAD certificate needs to be with the driver, but we'll keep an eye on the Q&A as we go through the event and come back to you perhaps at the Q&A session towards the end. Um, we're now going to have a, uh, a presentation about the requirements for customs procedures in GB. Um, so uh, for all of you moving your goods into GB, um, Nahid Williamson is going to talk you through the key dates and requirements. Nahid, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margaret. Uh, morning, everybody. Yes, my name is Nahid Williamson and I work in Her Majesty's Review and Customs. Um, and I'll be giving you um, a, a, a walkthrough on customs processes. Um, can I have the um, first slide, please? So just to give you um, a, a quick customs uh, overview um, for 2021 and 2022 um, and what will be required during this period. So starting with 2021, um, importers of non-controlled goods from the EU have the option of using the delayed declarations instead of full customs declarations. Um, this is now uh, beneficial for importers who have not yet put in place procedures to make full customs declarations or been authorised to use the simplified customs processes. So for delayed declarations, you will need to make a declaration in your commercial records at the time of import which is known as Entry into Declarance Record, EIDR, followed by a supplementary declaration within 175 days after the import. Um, but from 1st of January 22, importers or their agent will be approved at the, will need to be approved at the time of import to use the simplified procedures or they can make a full declaration. And from 1st of October, 21, the exit summary, summary declarations are now required on all exports from GB um, 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 to the EU, which means the waiver on empty pallets and containers moving under a transport contract ended on the 30th of September 2021. Um, and on imports from 1st of July uh, 2022, the entry summary declarations known as the ENS will be required. Um, so just, just a high level overview of the customs um, processes. Um, next slide, please. So on the state of security, the ENS, just to give you some detail on this, currently there is a 12 month waiver on ENS requirements for goods being imported from EU into GB. But as just mentioned from 1st July uh, 22, Full entry summary declarations will be required. Now, as this is, this is a legal requirement, the ENS will need to be complete and accurate at the time it is submitted into the safety and security GB system. Uh, and it must be done before the goods arrive into GB. Um, having said this, we know that information can sometimes change due to um, unexpected um, circumstances. So there is the ability to amend the ENS after the initial submission, and you can do that right up until the time the goods arrive 
into GB customs territory. Um, just to add, carriers have the legal responsibility to ensure that the safety and security declarations are submitted, um, but um, a third party may lodge a declaration if it is done with the carrier's knowledge and consent. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, making an ENS declaration. So in order to make the safety and security declaration, a GB URI number will be required. Um, the ENS information now will hold details uh, relating to the consignor, uh, uh, the consignee and a description of the goods and the routing itself with the, de with the details of the, and the time of arrival. Uh, now to submit an ENS, you will need to register and have access to the SNS GB service. And once registered on the SNS GB service, you can submit entry summary declaration by either purchasing the compatible software or employing the services of a community uh, system provider, the, the CSP. Next slide, please. So just to move across to the exit summary declaration, the EXS, this has been in place since the 1st of January 21, and the waiver for the movement asset of empty pallets, containers, and modes of transport being moved under contract and on all roll on, roll off, that's the row, row movement of goods ended on the 30th of September. An important point to note here is that in most cases, the safety and security requirements for exports are met using the customs export declaration. So this means that where an export declaration is not used, then from the 1st of October, an exit summary declaration uh, must be completed. Uh, can I have the uh, next slide, please? So just to give you some information on the models for customs controls. Um, now, from the 1st of January 22, there will be two main standard of custom models to control goods um, uh, important to GB. This will support the flow of goods and it will uh, minimise um, the risk of congestion. Uh, border locations receiving goods into GB from the EU will be able to operate the temporary storage model or a new pre-lodgement model. The, the temporary storage model um, will allow goods to be stored for up to 90 days at the frontier in an, in a, in an improved temporary storage facility before a declaration is made, uh, enabling officials to carry out any checks before goods are released from the facility. The pre-lodgement model now is for locations where space and the infrastructure um, will not accommodate the temporary storage. And under the pre-lodgement model, all goods will have to uh, will need to have the appropriate declaration before they board, um, and it will also enable communication with the person in control of the goods. For example, the driver of a lorry, or accompanied goods, or the carrier for unaccompanied goods, and this will happen by the time they arrive on whether the goods are cleared or need uh, an examination. Um, the ports that are operating the pre-lodgement will ensure that goods are not arrived at that location without the pre-lodge declarations. Um, and they will take reasonable steps to ensure goods are identified for any checks and are controlled upon arrival. So that responsibility will be with the ports. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So temporary storage. Um, under temporary storage model, imported goods from the EU can be stored temporarily up to 90 days before being released into free circulation, exported or placed under an inward or outward processing procedure. Um, from 1st of January, an inventory system will be required for all temporary storage facilities, which will include storage of non-EU goods too. Uh, and the ports using the temporary storage model can use GVMS the Goods Vehicle Movement Service to facilitate the control of pre lodge declarations for, un, uh, for accompanied RORO goods and be able to complete the Office of Transit function. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the pre lodgement 
and GVMS. So this new system, known as the Goods Vehicle Movement Service, um, has been, as, as I said, introduced to operate and support locations where pre-lodgement is required from 1st of January 22. Uh, it will also be used to control um, for control of Roro company traffic at temporary storage locations and the off transit function. Now, it has been operational for goods moving under transit since January 21, but will be used for all routes in January 22. So essentially, GVMS will enable HMRC to send notification of any risks either cleared or not cleared into the HMRC systems to the person in control of the goods by the time they physically arrive in the UK so they know where they need to go to. GVMS will also automate, as I said, the Office of Transit function, which uh, marks the entry of goods into the UK customs territory. Um, can I have the next slide, please? OK, thank you. Using GVMS for transit. Um, I just want to mention just very quickly for exports, um, that is the GVTU, although export declarations are required from January, you will not be able to pre-lodge these using GVMS until next year. And I wanted to mention that in the, the slide that just we've just um, passed through. OK, so using GVMS um, for transit movements. Um, just want to say a little bit on the transit movements here now. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to remember which slide we're using, <laughs> trying to get keep up with your slides. Um, so just want to say a bit more on the GVMS in relation to the transit movements in that for imports from 1st of January 2021, the transit uh, MRN is all that is required for uh, GMR entry. Um, and for export, that is GB to EU, although export declarations are required from January 21, you will not be able to use pre-lodge these using GVMS until next year. That's the point I wanted to make. OK, thank you. Using next slide, please. OK, thank you. Using GVMS. OK, so in order to use GVMS, both UK and EU hauliers uh, will need to register for GV GVMS to create a GMR. This means having a government gateway account, whether this is an existing or a new account, as long as it is the account used to create the GB URI. Um, they will need a GB URI, which is the Economic Operator Registration and Identification Number, and have access to GVMS. Um, for goods moving goods between EU to GB, traders will need access to Chief, NCTS, and GB Safety and Security Service through CSP, so that's a community service provider or a third party software. And similarly, hauliers and carriers will also need respective access to GVMS and the GB Safety and Security. And you can see all the different requirements in the slide there. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just a little um, process map or an image here for you. Uh, you can see the GVMS import process and the different steps involved for moving goods um, in what happens before they arrive at the EU place of exit and once they leave the EU place of exit for the crossing. Um, now, these slides will be shared with you afterwards, so I won't go into the detail um, at, the, uh, at, 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 at this point. Um, so I'll take the next slide, please. OK, so the Common Transit Convention, the CTC, again, I won't go into the detail. Um, so just briefly touching on this, as this information is self-explanatory, um, you will receive this in your slide pack afterwards. So um, I won't read out the detail here for you now. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. So I want to spend some time on transit um, and avoiding common errors. Um, so just to highlight some very common errors and mistakes when transit movements are not correctly discharged at the office of destination or by the authorised consignee. So I want to explain that when your goods arrive at the destination country, um, it is important that the transit accompanying document is presented to the customs at the office of destination. Uh, this is the customs office or at the premises of an authorised consignee. That could be your, your own 
or your agent's premises. Um, so essentially, they can so so this is so that they can inform the NCTS that the goods have arrived. Now, even if your goods have been presented to an office of transit at the border in the country of destination, the haulier must still attend an office of destination or premises of an authorised consignee to end the transit movement, um, which will allow the guarantee to be released. Uh, the guarantee will not be released until such time the transit movement has been ended. Um, and if you do not discharge your transit movement, the guarantee will not be released, um, which will mean that some traders will end up reaching their limit on their guarantees. And if the limit is reached, then new transit movements cannot start, which may cause significant, dis significant disruption uh, to your supply chain. Um, also want to draw out the point here that some hauliers are not completing the Office of Transit on GBMS because they are presenting their GB URI instead, which means they, this is not being legally compliant in moving goods under transit. Just want to make that point. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So there's some more errors here I want to draw out um, on transit movements. So um, just to draw out that if a transit movement is closed on NCTS before the goods have left the EU, this will be regarded as being legally non-compliant, uh, where a consignee closes off a transit movement before goods have been received. So in these circumstances, as the goods are no longer under a valid transit movement, they will be stopped at the border and held for checks and they may incur penalties. Um, there are examples of paperwork errors uh, and mistakes. So it is important to highlight that if the papers are not in order or information is missing, such as weight, volume or description of goods, the movement cannot be discharged on, on arrival and the guarantee cannot be released. Uh, can I take the next slide, please? So a little bit more here now on avoiding those errors. Um, now moving to the office of departure. Now, in terms of getting the office of departure right, a transit movement can only be started at the office of departure on the transit declaration, which cannot be diverted. It must be the location where goods are presented to border force by the haulier to begin the transit movement. And on the office of transit, um, it's making sure the Office of Transit you are travelling through is included in the transit declaration. The Office of Transit is the port of entry into the next customs area, not the port of exit being left behind. Um, to make this process simple and easy, the transit declaration must include each Office of Transit you will report to on your journey. So this will help the movement to be processed. Um, as quickly as possible at each location. So if you are bringing goods into the UK on behalf of someone else, make sure that they are aware of the route that you plan to take in advance so that they can declare the correct office or the offices of transit. Um, OK, thank you for that. Can I have the, um, the, 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 the next slide, please? So I'm going to move to the GB import. VAT VAT, um, and you can see on the slide, as it states, the postponed VAT accounting is available to VAT registered businesses for import from anywhere um, in the world, including the EU up to 31st of December 21. Um, and there are certain circumstances where importers must use the postponed VAT accounting. Um, but after that date, the use of PBA will be optional in nearly all of the circumstances. Uh, for delayed declarations or simplified procedures and EIDRs, that's the entry into declaration record, importers must use the PBA. PBA is available but optional to traders who do not use the delayed declarations and non-VAT registered traders will be able to pay the VAT at the point of declaration, uh, including supplementary declaration. 
Uh, um, also to highlight that the non-established taxable persons are also entitled to use the PVA, but they must hold a UK URI and instruct an agent to make the declaration uh, on their behalf. C can I have the next slide, please? Okay, just to um, touch on empty and returnable packaging. Um, so since January 2021, an import or export declaration has been required on reusable packaging and for return goods relief or temporary commission. Um, the declaration can be made orally or by conduct. I just want to explain that uh, in, a, in a bit more detail. Um, for imports, the packaging can be declared for free circulation to a border force officer, either by conduct or orally. Um, but for exports, if you are declaring exports of reusable packaging, you will not need to make them available for examination. Only if border force stop and ask to do an examination. Uh, the other thing to mention is that the import and export do not need to own the packaging of the goods contained in there, but to claim the return goods relief, the importer and exporter should um, be the same person. OK, um, can I have the next slide, please? So rules of origin, OK, the, the brief explanation here is that under the UK EU Trade Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, for origin preference, traders firstly need to classify their goods and they need to check that the goods meet the rules. To make a claim, the preference claim, the importer can use a statement of origin, which is made by the exporter that the product is originating, or they can use the importer's knowledge that the product is originating. And just to, 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 to mention, the register exporter system um, um, reference here, the REX number in the EU is the exporter's registered uh, number, which is required where the consignment has a total value of over 6,000 euros. But in the UK, the exporter reference number will be the economic operator registration and identification number, the EURI. Um, long one, that one. OK, um, I'll have the next slide, please. So just coming to this um, final slide on uh, pre preparing for 1st of January 2022. Um, this basically now summarises the key changes you need to prepare for. And the first important step is to really agree the income terms um, and by taking proper steps to agree the income terms in advance will ensure there is a clear understanding um, really on who is taking the responsibility for which part of the transaction. And it will make it easier for you to share information within your supply chain to follow a smoother transaction. So getting ready also means applying for any authorizations required for both IT and the simplified procedures. Um, and you can see a recap of summary, uh, a, a, a recap summary of key dates and safety and security and declarations, which we have just covered in some detail. Um, that, I think, brings me to the end of this customs presentation. And thank you for listening. I'll pass it back to Margaret. Thank you very much, Nahid. And um, I, I think I'd like to stress that first point that you've brought out there that um, agreeing the INCO terms and being very clear about who is responsible for what is a key step in all of this, making sure that everybody in the supply chain knows who's doing what and when. Um, and you've run through an awful lot of detail there and I can see some questions coming in that your colleagues are answering. Thank you very much. And we'll pick these up again at the Q&A and go into the, the themes in detail. But um, thank you very much, Nahid. And now, um, after that very quick pause, we're now going to move on to talk about bringing food and drink particularly into GB. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Andrew Chandiaramani. And Andrew is going to talk us through uh, the procedures for that. Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Margaret. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Chandiaramani, and I work in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to be 
um, talking you through the import controls for sanitary and phytosanitary goods entering Great Britain following the announcement that was made by the government on the 14th of September. Um, these slides will be shared with you after today's event and my colleagues will be joining us for the Q&A session later in the presentation. If you have any queries, please put them in the chat. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, this just goes through what I'm going to talk about. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so here's the controls since um, January 2021. So as you know, some changes were introduced in the, from the 1st of January 2021 and already applied to certain goods, such as products of animal origin under safeguard measures, live animals and high priority plants and plant products. There are links to further guidance on this page. If you need a refresher on these controls, on this page, if you need a refresher on these controls, sorry. So if we move to the next slide, please, I can talk through the changes to import controls. So I'll now give you a brief overview of the future import controls which will come into force next year before talking in more detail about IT systems, health certification and marketing standards. Now from 1st of January 2022, products of animal origin, animal byproducts and high risk food not of animal origin will need to be pre-notified. Pre-notification for all regulated plants and plant products will also be required. Now, notification should be made by your importer in Great Britain using the import of animals, food and feed system, or so-called IPAFs, in short. Now, this is a new IT system for notifying the authorities in Great Britain of the arrival of sanitary and phytosanitary goods. Now, from the 1st of July 2022, there will be new requirements for export health certificates for products of animal origin and animal byproducts. The requirements for phytosanitary certificates will be extended to all regulated plants and plant products and not, ju not just those which are high priority. These will also be subject to physical and identity checks at border control posts. Now, sanitary and phytosanitary goods will also need to enter Great Britain for an appropriate border control post, border control post to enable physical checks. However, physical checks of light of animals will continue at places of destination until notified otherwise. Have next slide, please. Now, so what do you need to know for the 1st of January 2022? Sorry, is that the wrong? Yes. Yeah, so, um, now, all sanitary and phytosanitary goods will need to be pre notified using the IT system IPAFs, as I said before. Now, is it, it is the responsibility for your importer in Great Britain to submit a pre notification on IPAFs. Now, in order to submit a notification, they will need the following information. Now, this includes the product being imported, the date that the product will be imported, which country the imported product is from, and the place of destination of the consignment. Now to access IPAFs, the importer will need to create a government gateway ID via gov.uk. The first person to register an organisation will become the administrative owner. Now in order to raise a notification, you will need to have a UK based entity that can be detailed on the application and is responsible for the consignment. Now you may need to employ an import agent to do this. Now any notification raised on IPAFs must be raised by the person responsible for that consignment. Now can I have the next slide please? Right, I'll now talk you through the export health certificates that will be required from the 1st of July 2022 in more detail. It is the EU exporter's responsibility to obtain the export health certificate, will be, which will be issued to you by the competent authority in the country from which you are exporting from. A certifying officer authorised by the competent authority must complete the official certificate. They could be an official veterinarian or official inspector, as defined by the relevant EU retained legislation. The EU exporter must send an electronic copy 
of the health certificate to the import in Great Britain. The original must be presented with the goods to the good border control post. Your importer in Great Britain must upload the electronic copy of the certificate to IPAFs as part of the pre-notification process. <coughs> Any official sanitary and phytosanitary documents that are required to accompany the health certificate will be specified on the relevant health certificate. Other documentation may be required depending on the commodity, such as a catch certificate for marine caught fish, as an example. Now, model health certificates are available on gov.uk, and you can use these to check the specific requirements, requirements for your commodity. However, I must stress that these are examples of the certificates. The real certificates will be issued by the relevant competent authority in your country. There are more details about how these certificates are filled in on the link at the bottom of this slide. Now, if you cannot identify an appropriate health certificate, you should speak to your importer in Great Britain and check with gov.uk for an import license. If there are no import licenses available, you will need to complete an IV58 form <coughs> and send it to the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Links are available on this slide. Now, the next slide, please. Now, from the 1st of July 2022, phytosanitary certificates will be required for all regulated plants and plant products. A phytosanitary certificate is a statement from the Plant Health Authority that the consignment has been officially inspected, complies with the legal requirements for entry into Great Britain, and is free from quarantine, pests and diseases. <coughs> the phytosanitary certificate will be obtained from the Plant Health Authority in the country where the supplier is based. The inspection for the phytosanitary certificate must take place no more than 14 days before the consignment is dispatched, and someone in the inspecting plant health authority must sign the phytosanitary certificate within the same 14-day period. You will need to upload a copy of the phytosanitary certificate on the import IT system, PEACH, if you need to pre-notify your consignment. Now if we move to the next slide, please. There's composite products. Now we tend to get a lot of questions from businesses about composite products, so I'll, I'll cover this quickly for you. <coughs> now firstly, to clarify what I mean by a composite product, these are food products that are intended for human consumption only. They contain a mix of processed products of animal origin and plant products used as a main ingredient, not just added for flavouring or processing. Now to give you a few examples, and this includes a, um, a ready meal lasagna, pork pies or mayonnaise if it contains more than 50% egg. Now composite products must follow the staged requirements for products of animal origin, so, the, so they will require pre-notification from the 1st of Jan 2022 and from 1st of July 2022, they will require health certification and to arrive at a border control post. However, there are a few exemptions. Now, goods are exempt if they contain less than 50% processed animal products, no meat products, and they meet the requirements set out in legislation outlined in the slide. If your goods contain any meat products, or are more than 50% animal products, it must be pre-notified using IPAFs. It must be accompanied by an export health certificate and follow the phase approach set out in the products of animal origin. If you're not sure if this applies to your product, there is detailed guidance including composite product decision tree available on the animal imports file sharing link, which you will find at the end of the presentation. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? Now, from the 1st of July 2022, the process for pre notifying sanitary and phytosanitary goods, SPS goods, on IPAFs will change. So, from July, a common health entry document or CHED will be required. <coughs> this means that further this means that further information will need to be entered as part of the notification. This required information 
is laid out in this slide for you. But this includes information such as the country of import, the product, the reason for imports, and transportation details. Now the SPS process map, which will apply from the 1st of July, can be found in the next slide for, your, for further details. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is the process map. I won't go to, through this in detail, and you can read this at your leisure. So I can have the next slide, please. <coughs> So if we move on, on to transits, so there are some changes being implemented for products transit, transiting through Great Britain. Now from the 1st of January 2022, animal products transiting through Great Britain will need to be pre-notified on IPAFs before entry. <coughs> before the goods leave the country, they'll need to be pre -no need to be notified to authorities. Plant and plant products will need to be accompanied with a signed declaration stating that the goods are under phytosanitary transit. There are no requirements to pre-notify these goods. Now, from the 1st of July 2022, consignments transiting through Great Britain will require an export health certificate and must enter and exit through a point of entry with an appropriate designated border control post. So I can no go through the next slide, please. Some groupage. So this is the next issue I'll touch on. So what do I mean by groupage? This is the commercial grouping of multiple consignments within a single sealed trailer or container. There are four models that have been developed for importing groupage loads into Great Britain. Now these include the consolidated consolidated hub method. Um, this is where different consignments are brought together at a single approved premises. The certification takes place for all individual consignments by the certifying officer. Grouped consignments are loaded and sealed before they leave for onward destination. Now the next model is something called the sequential or single model. Now this facilitates picks up pickups from multiple sites. Certification takes place at each site. A seal is applied to the overall load at each pickup point removed and replaced at the next pickup point. This method relies on a certificate of non-manipulation. The next one is the linear or multiple pallet model. <clears throat> this is designed to facilitate pickups from multiple sites with certification at each collection point in the chain. This requires pallet level sealing. Here sealed pallets are added to the means of transport and the individual seal number on the pallet recording, pallet recorded on the export health certificate. There is no requirement for a certificate of non-manipulation with this model, but it does require the presence of certifying of a certifying officer at each collection point. <clears throat> now, all models used in conjunction with each other can be used in conjunction with other, as long as general principles around sealing and certification remain. For example, traders may wish to blend the linear model with the consolidation hub method. The key with the mixed hybrid approach will be ensuring full traceability of all products entering Great Britain. We will be sending out links with further information once we have updated these to reflect the recent changes from in September. Now, can I have the next slide, please? So I'll not talk you through marketing standards in more detail. Marketing standards will differ according to the product you're exporting, so please do visit the links provided for detailed guidance. <coughs> Excuse me. From the 1st of July 2022, all hops imports from third countries, both EU and non-EU countries, will require a GB attestation equivalence, attestation of equivalence, which is issued by an authorised agency from the country of origin. Now until the 30th, 30th of June 2022, imported hops and hop products must be accompanied by one of the following documents. So this is either uh, an EU attestation of equivalence, which is issued by an authorised agency, or an EU certificate from EU member states, issued by an approved certif certification centre. Now, with regards to wine, 
the UK is taking steps to remove the requirement for VI1 certification for wine imports. We expect the certification requirement to permanently end on the 31st of December this year. Subject, this is subject to approval. Now, an EU poultry meat with optimal indications for farming and chilling methods or both will need a third country listing, a third country listing or an EU competent authority certificate. So could I the next slide please, Org organics. You may also need to be aware of the upcoming controls for organic products and food labeling. Now from the 1st of July next year, organic products imported from the EU to GB will require certification of inspection, a certificate of inspection. You will need to use the interim manual GB organic import system to do this. And then next slide, please, food labeling. <coughs> and lastly, in terms of food labeling, you have a little longer to make the necessary changes. For any pre-packed food placed onto the GB market after 31st of September 2022, a UK-based food business operator or UK importer address will be required. Labeling rules will apply once the food is placed on the market rather than when it's been imported. Therefore, food information may be corrected following imports, but before the food is placed on the market in the UK. Overstickering is acceptable method for correct information, but an oversticker must not obscure or cover any mandatory information, for example, the date mark or lot mark. So can I have the next slide, please? So this concludes my presentation today. Many thanks for your attention. You can access further information through our links in the presentation. And I'll now pass you back to Margaret. Thanks very much. Andrew, thank you. Lots of detail there again, and I'm sure the audience are digesting it um, for food. Um, right, uh, we're going to uh, move on to something slightly different now. Um, we've got a presentation from um, Erin Fair, who works at the uh, Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And Erin, if you'd like to take us through the requirements for Oh, I do apologise. I have the things in the wrong order. My apologies. Sorry. We'll have to wait for Erin. Um, first of all, we're going to uh, take your goods through Kent and the Short Straits and Lucy Dennis is going to talk us through the detail about um, the facilities at Kent and the Short Straits. Thank you, Lucy. Apologies. It's OK. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Lucy and I work in BPDG's contingency and locations team. Um, and as Margaret said, I'm going to talk you through uh, uh, some of the facilities in Kent and the Short Straits. Um, so I'm just going to whiz through the first few slides, please. Um, so the first slide uh, here shows a map of both commercial sites and HMG uh, inland border facilities in Kent. And then moving on to the next slide, uh, you'll be able to see um, the IBFs outside of Kent um, and these sites will uh, further aid traffic management and I'll touch on uh, that again briefly later on. Um, so if I can have the next slide that would be fabulous, thank you. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of Sevington IBF. Um, so from January 2022 all short straits traffic requiring checks will be directed to Sevington. And then after full inbound checks come into effect in July 2022, uh, traffic will continue to be directed to Sevington. However, as the, uh, the Dover sites go live, uh, these will become available as well. And I will talk you through those other sites later on. So the checks completed at Sevington include CITES, ATA and TIR Carnets, traffic management, office of uh, departure and office of transit compliance checks and border readiness checks. Um, so just a quick piece of information, stays at the site are limited to two hours. Uh, so it's a relatively uh, short turnaround time. Um, there's an IBF app available for drivers that have access to a smartphone. Um, this will help you get processed as quickly as possible. Um, and you can also use this service to let HMRC know in advance that you're attending an IBF because the goods that you're moving fall into one of the following categories. 
So they're going to an office of departure or destination. So they're starting or ending a transit movement. Uh, they are covered by an ATA carnet or they need a CITES permit. Thank you. Next slide, please. So currently, um, HMRC and Border Force are active on site, but in due course, uh, they will be joined by DEFRA, DVSA and uh, Port Health authorities as well. Uh, so the quoted capacity here is what's expected from January 2022. However, um, please bear in mind that the site is evolving with changing requirements, uh, so it's possible that the actual number might not be realised. But uh, we can give you a kind of a brief uh, view of that. So the total expected capacity is 1,095. Uh, sorry, 1,095 even. Um, and uh, breaking that down, that kind of means 550 holding spaces, 300 uh, contingency freight management spaces and 245 spaces in the swim lanes. So uh, thinking about contingencies, so if Sevington were to be closed, uh, drivers would be advised um, uh, and redirected to another available site. So as uh, the, uh, the map earlier in the presentation showed, uh, those sites are Northfield uh, IBF, Ebbsfleet IBF, uh, Warrington and Birmingham IBF. Uh, so you can actually find uh, live updates on gov.uk um, under the uh, attending an IBF section. So that's pretty easy to, to find. Uh, literally just search on gov.uk and you can find live updates um, of all of the IBFs. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, these are just the, the future sites uh, that we're expecting in Kent. So uh, Dover IBF uh, is going to be a further HMRC site. Um, with, uh, the aim is that this will uh, be online by the end of 2022. Uh, the site will act as a location for inbound and outbound transits of goods uh, to and from the UK, and providing a facility from which customs checks can be implemented um, all year round. So literally 24 seven, 365 days a year. So the DEFRA Dover site um, is uh, being developed for a uh, product of animal origin checks. Um, further details, unfortunately, are not currently available as it's uh, at a commercially sensitive stage. And then last but not least, uh, the additional DEFRA site um, being considered uh, is for small animal checks. Uh, but again, uh, further details aren't available as this is in very early stages, uh, but more information will be provided co uh, closer to completion. Um, and I think that uh, completes the whistle stop tour of uh, facilities in Kent. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Now, uh, now we definitely are going to come on to uh, talk about the UKCA marking and Erin Fair from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy is going to take us through. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, so yes, my name is Erin Fair and I work in the business readiness side of the um, Department for Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, working on business readiness for the implementation of the UKCA marking regime. Um, as many of you may know, the CE mark is the mark that we previously used um, for uh, goods that had to be product certified. UKCA is the regime that's coming into force now. So I just want to talk you through quickly the timeline. Um, many of you may be aware that at the end of August, we announced that we were going to be extending the deadline for full implementation of the UKCA mark by one year. So if I can have the next slide. Thanks. All right, so where we currently are is that transitional, maser, sorry, transitional measures are in place, which means that you can still place CE marked goods on the market in Great Britain and have them circulate until they reach their end user. Um, and it's also the same for existing stock that might be CE marked as well. Additionally, though, you may also start using the UKCA mark um, at any time during the And we really do encourage businesses, especially those that need to have their products um, third party assessed uh, for conformity. Please get that process going as soon as you can uh, so you can integrate that UKCA marking into your uh, product design. So. Again, 
currently uh, you have until the 1st of January 2023 before the UKCA marking will be required for what we call new approach goods. Good general rule of thumb is that if your product currently requires a CE marking, it will require a UKCA marking. Um, so then um, in addition to this uh, and extending the deadline for UKCA implementation, we have also extended what's called the labeling easement. So for an additional year afterwards until the 1st of January 2024, you may also attach, uh, rather than having the UKCA marking directly affixed onto your products, you can put it on with a sticky label or attach it to accompanying documents. Uh, when it comes to labeling, this is one of those areas where it's really important that you uh, seek out the guidance specific to your products, as not all these rules are going to fit with the same. Uh, same thing goes for the timeline as well. Uh, there are certain um, different dates for things like uh, construction products and medical devices as well. So again, please seek out your specific product rules. Um, additionally, my colleague Adrian, who's here helping me with uh, questions, is going to put into the chat um, a couple of links to guidance pages where you can find some more information and also our email address. Um, we do have, uh, we're able to receive questions. We aren't able to advise on anyone's specific circumstances, mind you, uh, but we will do our best to assist you in any way we can. Can I have the next slide? All right, so just some general um, reminders about how the UKCA requirements work. Um, as we say, uh, anything that's required a CE marking is um, going to require a UKCA marking most likely, or the reverse epsilon for aerosol products. Um, when it comes to third-party conformity assessment testing, again, if you are having a product tested for the UK, uh, well, the GB or uh, Northern Ireland markets, that um, conformity assessment body needs to be conformity assessed for the UKCA mark. Uh, conversely, assessment for the CE mark needs to be done by assessment body that is certified to do the CE mark. Um, so you may have to do two of those. So again, um, you may also apply both the CE marking and the UKCA marking to the same product if it has been assessed and is meant for sale in both the EU and GB markets as well. Um, so uh, you say, please put your questions in the chat and do send us an email if you have anything further after this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, a lot of our presentations have focused on um, the immediate actions and preparation that you need to take. Um, and now just to look a little further into the future, uh, we're joined by my colleague Lawrence McGahan from the team who are handling the single trader window um, and looking at our future uh, border changes. So Lawrence, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, and, and hello all. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about Single Trade Window. My name is Lawrence McGregor. I am the stakeholder engagement lead for the Single Trade Window program, uh, which uh, sits within Border Protocol and Delivery Group within the Cabinet's Office. Um, if I can move to the next slide, please. So what is the Single Trade Window? The single Trade Window uh, will transform the way that traders and government interact at the border um, as a single uh, gateway. It's an integral part of the UK's 2025 uh, border strategy um, and is very much um, defined by the World Customs Organization. Um, and they define that as a facility that allows parties involved in trade and transport to lodge standardized information and documents with a single entry point to fulfill all import, export and transit related regulatory requirements. So quite, quite a mouthful that, but um, defines exactly what a single trade window, uh, which has been adopted by other countries across the world. Uh, the UK government intends to build a, a core WCO feature um, as well as industry date, uh, data features by the end of 2025. Um, and uh, out, outlined below, um, are sort of the, 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 the current model that we're looking to adopt. Um, as you can see, it involves some key departments across government, including uh, HMRC, um, DIT, Department of International Trade, DEFRA, and the Home Office is our sort of top four key stakeholders that will play a part in um, defining the single trade window design. Um, the single trade window, however, will not be replacing uh, or replicating uh, any existing UK government backend systems, so they will remain as is, um, but instead they'll be acting as a single gateway to these systems um, uh, as a front end interacting with the back end of those services as a way of data exchange, uh, significantly improving user interaction. 
The service will enable users to be uh, recognized as a single authenticator, um, understanding sort of the or unique business needs um, and pointing you to the services required based on whatever go goods you are looking to import or export in and out of the UK. If I can move to the next slide, please. Um, so this just goes a little bit further, giving you some examples um, of the functionality of the single trade window um, and the areas that we're focusing on sort of pre, at and post the UK border. Um, Interestingly as well, I think uh, industry has regularly pointed out that you can track a five pound takeaway uh, to your front door, but you can't check uh, or the origin of or track a multi million pound consignment. So single trade window will allow uh, you to be able to track consignments um, and potentially linking with other worldwide single trade windows. So providing an end to end uh, visibility of those consignment journeys. Um, and single trade window will also allow for intercontinental interoperability, building to the same standards and further improving any data flow. Um, so just to call out some of the key uh, areas um, on the on the chart below, highlighted in, in red, orange and green, um, I won't call them all out. Uh, the slides will be shared, um, but uh, it'll, as I say, provide a sim single entry um, single authentication uh, to any user or organization. Uh, so single sign on for traders and agents um, and will be a digital entry point for submissions. Um, it will simplify the process, therefore removing duplication um, and but also improve data flow across the UK government. Um, this will allow for uh, greater visibility on goods processing, uh, transit facing and compliance checks at the border. So that's with all our all those uh, government departments that perform a function at the border, uh, namely HMRC and uh, the Home Office Border Force, for example, um, and it will optimize the supply chain. Um, and then post the border, um, we're looking at, you know, better data sharing across, as I say, government departments, um, enhancing uh, sort of how we can inform infrastructure, um, any process changes and the proficient, uh, ultimately the provision of improved risking and targeting, allowing the compliant goods to move across the border um, un uninhibited. Um, just to give you uh, an idea of where we are on the development of single trade window, we've already introduced a new um, single trade window guidance service uh, called Check How to Import or Export Goods. Um, you'll be able to find that on gov.uk. Um, at phase one of that service focuses on import guidance, um, basically putting businesses and their trade at the center of the service um, and asking a number of specific questions in order to provide you, the user, the trader with specific structured steps that you will need to take to import, import goods in and out of the UK. Um, that is done via commodity code. Um, further developments uh, include a lookup service, um, uh, so again, through the commodity code. So now you can simply put the commodity code in and check your consignments, um, but also uh, looking at trade tariff and, and tax duties calculator uh, that traders um, can then check to see what they are required to do, but also uh, what costs may be involved. And then later on, we are looking at implementing an import date feature um, that allow uh, that any changes that come online in January, 20, um, and through into July 2022, uh, where you'll be able to provide accurate information um, related to that import date. Um, I'll move back uh, back on now to to Margaret. That's the end of my presentation. Um, but uh, please feel free to uh, reach out if you've got any further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, are now going to uh, just go through a couple of case studies with you. On the next slide, we've got um, a series of case studies. We've prepared um, six case studies. I'm not going to go through them all in detail. You may be pleased to hear, but we will share them with you and they will be translated into Polish. We've brought them together to try and illustrate a full end to end movement. Um, we've covered uh, something as perhaps as straightforward as exporting auto parts from Poland to GB. Um, then we've uh, we were going to do that from January and then we'll talk. Uh, we'll have another case study that explains what changes 
after the 1st of July. We're then going to talk about, uh, we've included a case study about moving fish fingers from Poland to GB, which is sort of layering on the SPS procedures on top of the customs procedures. And finally, we've included a case study um, moving excise goods from Belgium, uh, from, sorry, from Poland into uh, GB and again using transit. So that's a very complex case study, but we thought you might find it useful and helpful to work through once you've um, accommodated all the detail. In our case studies, it is important to say that we have um, identified who the importer and the exporter is, and we've said what the importer and the exporter and hauliers and others in between are responsible for. We recognise that you will have terms that may mean that different people are responsible for different elements of the procedures, but we wanted to set out very clearly what those procedures were. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. We've got here a summary of the, um, the systems that the exporter, importer and haulage company, um, as I said, this is a fairly simple example, um, have got to sign up for and be ready for. So um, obviously an EU exporter will need an EU EORI number. Um, a UK importer will need a GB EORI number and a haulage company moving between the EU and GB will need to have both an EU and a GB EORI number. And I saw a question earlier in the chat, you can apply for a GB EORI number even if you are not based in the UK. So those EORI numbers need to be in place. After that then, from the 1st of January, if you're importing goods through a port that operates the pre-lodgement model, um, you're going to need to sign up for GVMS. The importer, of course, will need to have signed up and make sure that they can pre-submit their import declaration through CHIEF. If you are delivering goods duties paid, you may be able to do that yourself or you may need to get a local agent to do that for you. So you'll need to submit the import declaration and then the haulage firm will need to have signed up um, and be registered to use the GVMS, the Goods Vehicle Movement Service that Nahid talked us through. So that's just a brief outline of the systems that will be needed from the 1st of January. On to the next slide, please. These are not very pretty case studies, I recognise, but we've tried to set out step by step what each uh, person in the supply chain is going to have to do and when. So, of course, um, the first point is that uh, the importer and exporter, that is Damien and Claire in this case, will have to agree their um, terms of trading, their INCO terms. Um, in this case, we're saying that Damien is responsible for the export with Claire being responsible for the import. Um, so Damien, of course, will submit his export declaration to the Polish customs systems, as Ava talked us through earlier. Um, and Poland would be the country of export in this example. And we're saying, for instance, France could be the country of exit from the EU. Um, Damien will have submitted a combined export declaration um, and a separate and uh, exit summary declaration will not be required because the detail would be on that. Again, as Ava said, that is possible in Poland. So after Damien has submitted his declaration, the Polish customs procedure, um, an EAD document, allocates a movement reference number. So the other thing to be thinking about now is that Claire needs to be thinking about pre-lodging her import declaration in, uh, in the UK. She needs to do that before the haulage firm moves the goods from the EU. So she submits the UK import documentation using the chief system. Um, and this will produce a movement reference number for that import declaration. And she gives that to her haulage firm, to uh, Joe, the haulage firm. The haulage firm will need to have registered for the Goods Vehicle Movement Service, the GVMS. They will uh, need to uh, have the details of the import declaration. So what they will do is they will create a goods movement reference number, as Nahid outlined, and that they'll use that then to link the movement reference number for the import declaration in GB um, and the vehicle details, all of that will be combined and submitted on, through the GVMS system and form what they call a goods movement reference number. Um, so uh, the driver, of course, will have to have the export declaration to leave the EU. Um, and I imagine many of you are familiar with that procedure now. Um, so I'm just going to skip on then to point number nine, where 
Joe will provide the goods movement reference number at check-in. When he's checking in to come over to GB, he'll provide that goods movement reference number. The carrier systems will talk to HMRC systems and they will check that that goods movement reference number is valid. If it's not valid, the driver will not be able to board. So uh, when the truck embarks on the shuttle or ferry, um, the export company document, the export will be discharged, as you know. And meanwhile, in GB, the systems are checking that the goods movement reference number, uh, they're looking into that and deciding whether or not the goods require inspection. If they do, they will be issued with a health status. And this message will be communicated uh, to the haulage company through uh, various means. Um, some carriers might display it on boards. Um, in other cases, the haulage company may need to look it up look up the status on the web page. So if they do require inspection, the goods uh, if coming into Kent will need to go to an inland border facility for any checks to take place. If they don't, then they can carry on and drive to the warehouse and then Claire can update the import details and so on. So a fairly, uh, um, it's a, a sort of a basic case study that sets out the requirements for customs controls. If we move on to the next slide, We've done the same case study, we've imported the same goods, but after the 1st of July. And what changes then on the, um, on the next couple of slides, if we could move on a couple of slides, please. Thank you. What changes then is that an entry summary declaration will be required. Um, and uh, it will be up to the carrier to make that entry summary declaration. In this case, because um, Joe and the uh, operator are moving it across the border, they will be the active means of transport. So they would be responsible for making the entry summary declaration. And they, to do that, they'll need to have registered for and have the links and the software to access the uh, safety and security system in GB SNS. And we've outlined that on the previous slide. So we've now reworked that example that I talked to you through earlier, adding in the safety and security step here. We hope you found that helpful. Um, the next case study is um, about exporting fish fingers from Poland to GB. And if we could just skip on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Again, we've outlined the systems that you need to register for. And of course, adding in this particular one, we need to um, clear the importer or whoever is responsible for uh, the import controls needs to have access to the IPATH system. It's important to note, and I, um, I know that Andrew outlined this in his conversation, in his presentation, but um, if you are not based in the UK, you cannot have access to the IPAP system, so you will need to get a local agent to do that for you. But in this example, we've assumed that Claire is going to be doing the pre-notification herself into the IPAP system. And as you recall, Andrew set out the detail that she'll need to submit from the 1st of January. On the next slide, we've got um, that case study. As you can see, now because we're talking about fish here, we've uh, we've mentioned the requirements that are going to need, uh, be needed about catch certificates and processing certificates. So we hope it's useful and it gives you an example of the kind of procedures that would be layered along with the basic customs procedures for SPS goods. Of course, it will vary. So this is a these are fish fingers that will be exported after the 23rd of January. So they will be requiring a pre-notification and um, in the uh, UK's IPATH system. And if we move on to the next slide. And sorry, another couple of slides, please. Thank you. We've then done that same movement, those goods coming in to GB um, after the 1st of July the 23rd of July. So additionally, then you're going to have to have export health certificates issued and also the uh, safety and security declarations will need to be submitted if the goods are not. So in the fish finger situation, you've got various certificates that are required. Um, and But if it was other food and drink, the export health certificate would need to be there too. We appreciate there's a lot of detail included here. Um, and we recognise, of course, that uh, you will need the time to go through it. We will translate them to Polish and we will share the slides with you. As I said, the final uh, case studies that we've produced, if we could just skip down to them, please. Thank you, Kathleen. So this is exporting beer from Poland to GB through the short straits using transit. So um, if we go down to the perhaps the detailed case study, 
Again, we've outlined the systems here for you and we've done a step by step movement of that. So you've got all the interaction there with the transit system, the NCTS system, all of the requirements there. And of course, the access with the um, excise systems, EMCS and worth remembering, of course, that the EU and the GB EMCS systems are now separate systems. They do not link. So um, lots of detailed case studies for you to go through. Um, at the risk of repeating myself, we will translate them into Polish for you and you will have them available for you. Thank you. After all that detail, I think we've got going to come now to um, uh, Q&A. Our Q&A uh, session. And um, thank you very much. You've been putting in lots of questions for us, and I know that my colleagues um, and others have been answering those questions. But um, if we can come back to, I think, one of our earlier questions, Ava, if you're still with us, we had a question in about the EAD for exports from the EU. There was a question about whether the driver must have a physical copy of the EAD. Must he have it printed out to leave the EU? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, the driver has to have in his hand the uh, EAD. It's uh, useful to present it at the customs office of exit, and it will help to uh, to manage the customs formalities on the smooth path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and the other question that I saw that uh, you, you might want to respond to is that there was a question about um, goods coming from a third country into the EU and then moving on to GB. And what were the procedures there? So I think if they were coming from a third country using uh, that was part of the Common Transit Convention, they could move using the transit system. But if they were coming from a country that wasn't part of the Common Transit Convention, um, and coming into the EU, would they need to be imported into the EU and exported out again to get to GB? Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, it seems to be correct. Uh, yes. They can uh, pass uh, under transit or they can be imported uh, uh, in the e e uh, EU and then exported uh, from the EU to the uh, GB. Yeah, but Thanks. the decision is on the um, entity side, which uh, which procedure is uh, fits better. Of course, mm -hmm. and I know that um, my colleagues in HMRC have added in some detail there in the chat about the UK procedures. So um, I hope that helps the the person who asks the question. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> Um, I'll keep an eye on those questions coming in, um, but I think a lot of the questions that I've got now are for our UK colleagues, um, Nahid and team. Um, we had a question about services and I think um, our colleague, one of your colleagues posted some details um, about providing services to um, Poland from the UK. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that or is that enough? Hi Margaret. No, I think um, the guidance, the link that we gave pretty much will be the helpful uh, uh, place to get more information. So there's nothing extra to add other than what we've posted for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there was a, a couple of exchanges about the entry summary declaration and the responsibility of who is who that is. Um, am I correct that it is the active means of transport? So could you outline for us what that means, please? Yeah, OK, so so really in theory, that means the, the person who is actually facilitating that. So if it's a carrier, then the responsibility will be for the unaccompanied movements will be for the carrier. Mm -hmm. If accompanied, uh, it would be the driver, the haulier, who will have the responsibility for the ENS safety and security. And that becomes the active mode of transport, if you like. It's a little tricky. But it, it really wants you need to break it down between accompanied and unaccompanied. But predominantly, it's the carrier, the active mm -hmm. transport, who has the responsibility for this. 
Thank you very much. Um, and the follow up question to that was about EU entities um, getting an EORI number. There, was, there seemed to be an, uh, a belief that uh, perhaps an EU entity couldn't get an EORI number in GB. Um, but I think your colleague corrected that. Is that the case? Right, they I just can. wanted to bring that in. Yeah, but they, they can apply for GB EORI um, and, 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 and be able to, 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 to do this function. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was then a series of questions, and I, I think it's from the same person who was talking about the transit procedure in Kent. So if a transit movement, as far as I can gather, a transit movement would be started in Great Britain um, and the uh, it would be started remotely with the driver collecting the TAD um, at a uh, at Sevington or at an IBF, but perhaps being called for a check down to Dover and being directed to MOTUS. Um, are you or your colleagues able to talk us through the procedures of starting a uh, transit movement remotely and where should uh, drivers go to collect their TADs? I think the, the purpose of the question is probably to avoid somewhere where they might have to pay a fee as well. So, so Margaret, I'll, I'll, I'll invite my colleague. Um, I'm hoping he's got the speaker role here so he can mm -hmm. speak. Um, uh, James, are you able to take that question now or? Should we take that, bring that back later? Hi, Nahid. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's not that's no problem. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you. James. Yeah, as as uh, as we replied to there, if if you are booking the movement, um, you will you will you will need to get a TAD print out before the transit movement is started. Um, you can either do this at an IBF facility for a normal movement, or if it's started by a consignor, then then the TAD should be printed um, by them as and given to you as, as as the driver as part of that process. Um, there is, we understand, um, an IBF attendance app which people can use to book attendance there. Um, we can't remember the name of it necessarily. Um, but if people are attempting to use that and book an appointment at a, an inland border facility to start the movement um, but are unable to do this, then that is something that we would like to know because we, we would take that forward and inquire with Border Force as to why that's not happening. Thank you, James. And at the end of this, we give a, an address for people to contact us with follow up inquiries. So by all means, if if you're not getting, uh, as James outlined there, uh, the service is outlined, please do get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, James or others, uh, or Lucy, uh, is anybody able to talk a little bit about uh, which IBFs would be appropriate for goods coming into Perfleet and Tim Tilbury? Or would the goods be done at the ports themselves? Who's that question for, Margaret? Um, anybody who can answer it, really. <laughs> if HMRC, uh, no, um, I mean, uh, but from my limited experience, understanding of Tilbury, I believe there, there is a customs um, check on site at the port, but I may be wrong. Hi, Margaret and Heed. I'll, yes. I'll take that one as well. Thank you. Um, there'll be no change from the 1st of January 2022. The process is the same then as it is now. Uh, if a transit movement has declared an office of departure of Tilbury or Perfleet, then they will have to start the movement from, from that office of departure. Um, they can use an inland border facility for movements where the office of where the declared office of departure is Dover. Um, but other than Birmingham and Warrington, which we understand also support Hollyhead, um, you can't cannot start movements from other offices of departures. Uh, if you want to use an inland border facility and declare the office departure as Dover, um, then you would, can start the movement en route, um, but the decision needs to be made at the initial declaration stage. Um, it is not possible to divert a movement to a different office of departure. A new declaration would have to be submitted. Um, and I'll put something in the um, Q&A to respond to that um, written, of a, of a written, written variety. Thank you very much, James. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and Nahid, I think we had a bit of a follow up question to the, the conversation about the accompanied and unaccompanied. Um, the question was, does this split between the carrier and haulier in the case of accompanied and unaccompanied movement, is it valid for all safety and security declarations? I think there is a simple answer to that, but I'll let you tell me. Sorry, Mark, I'm mute. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I think is that for the um, entry summary declarations, um, I think we're relating to, aren't we? Yes. 
you on mute, Margaret. Yes, so the answer is yes, then I think, yes. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Need. thank you. Lovely, thank you. Well, um, well probably to come off mute. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, a, a few questions now for our colleagues in DEFRA. Um, thank you very much. Um, there was a question in quite early on about um, CITES. I wonder if somebody is able to cover that about um, how long a CITES uh, certificate is valid for in the UK. Please do let us know if you can answer that. If not, we can take it away. Come back. Hi there, uh, it's Ali from the DEFRA CITES team. Um, I want to reply um, to the answer in the Q&A, um, but to summarise briefly, um, so CITES import permits are needed for most imports now from the EU. Uh, and in terms of the validity length of the, the CITES permit, we will always try and match uh, the validity of the export or re-export permit that's being presented. Uh, so I think in the uh, example uh, question, um, the, the re-export or export permit had a validity of six months, so in that case we would match that validity on the, the CITES import permit. Thank you very much Holly, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, there was a question about asking us whether we were aware of issues, um, the customs issues on food, so it could go to HMRC and or to DEFRA really this question, um, at London airports, is that something that's uh, on your radar or should we ask the questioner to perhaps send us a bit more detail and we can go through that. Okay, I'm um, so going to take silence as a, um, to the person who asked that question, we will take that away, um, but if you could send us perhaps some more detail and I'll show you the email address to send us that through to later, we can try and answer that for you. Um, the other question was um, about food that may be stopped. And again, this might be something that either HMRC or DEFRA could answer, or indeed our friends from the Food Standards Agency if they're here. But if um, food coming into GB is stopped and requires a customs check, um, will there be cold stores available? Will the food be able to maintain its temperature while those checks go ahead? Are in here. Um, I have yeah. to guess a little bit at the question because food that comes in uh, is is maybe directed for a BCP check, which also involves the custom facilities on the same site. So if it's called for a customs check, if that was the intention of the question, it would go have to go to a BCP, and then it can only go to a BCP that has the appropriate facilities to handle the temperature requirement of that food. So in that case, the answer is yes. Lovely, thank you. So it's important then to make, of course, the other key point that was brought out in the presentation is that food from the 1st of July will need to enter through a BCP, a port that has a BCP that handles that food stuff. OK, thank you. Um, there was another question uh, about whether Polish exporters need to be registered for traces from the 1st of January 2022. Our, are DEFRA colleagues able to help with that? So Margaret, I can answer from the, the plant health side. So obviously um, on the plant health side for sort of imports, we'll be using IPATHs. Um, so obviously Polish exporters won't register for that system. It will be the GB importer that will register to be able to make the pre-notification on that side. Uh, but I don't know if there was anything that the animal colleagues would like to add to that at all. I'm guessing I'm the one to speak to that, um, assuming nobody else from DEFRA on this topic. So the, it's the same for animals and animal products. The importer or the representative <coughs> for the importer exporter based in GB must make the IPAFS declaration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I hope um, I hope you found our presentations useful today. Um, we've gone through a lot of detail. We appreciate that. We'll give you time to think about it, but do please um, get yourselves prepared. Ensure you understand who is doing what in the supply chain, um, and that is all clear. Um, we have, uh, if we could go on to the next slide, please. We've got um, some guidance available, of course, on gov.uk. There's the, the uh, border operating model. There's a haulier handbook and we've provided the links here. We're doing more events across the EU. Um, 
with our partners in the uh, embassies uh, across the EU. So do feel free to join those. They will be similar to this. Um, and of course, if you've got some follow up questions or you want to expand on something you've given us, please do contact us at this email address here, bpdg.inquiries. Um, thank you very much for your participation and particularly to those of you who've um, participated in our Slido poll. And I think on the next slide we've got a final question for you. We hope we've provided the information you need or at least pointed you in the right direction to understand more detail about it. But if not, what more would you like to have seen um, today from us? And I think um, without uh, as probably finishes our webinar. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and please do fill in question three. Thank you. <laughs>